All right, welcome to my talk, Redesigning Legacy Systems, Keys to Success. Uh, one last straggler. All right, my name is Pete Muldoon. I'm a senior architect lead at Bloomberg, and currently I work on converting our, what we call ticker plant, or where we take all the data from exchanges and distribute it. It's a core part of the system, moving that to Linux. So this talk will not be about that. That is more of an enterprise move. It's a gigantic system. This talk today will deal with something smaller, something more close to the ground when you're actually looking to do a redesign. So where will we be going on this talk? This talk will be about delivering a redesigned, a redesigned system all the way to production. Because if you do not deliver it to production, your work is never realized. Right, so you have a really great thing and you never get the production, no one ever sees it. It was essentially wasted work. This talk is for smaller system rewrites. Okay, this means it's like a single person or up to a small team doing it. It is not about uh, enterprise systems. Enterprise systems have another dynamic, which I, I have and am living the nightmare of. There's a lot more coordination and a lot more uh, cross company buy in needed. And the talk is in two main parts. The first part is the principles to follow or what I follow when I'm looking to redesign a system. And the second part is a case study of a real world system. Okay, so this will be grounded in reality. I like to have my talks have a practical edge to them. So I'm not just gonna give you a bunch of, you know, uh, disconnected principles and not show you how to mate them with the real world. If anyone has questions, the slide numbers are in the bottom right-hand corner. If you can please take a note of the slide numbers, just makes it easy to get back to what, we're, what, what you're asking the question about. <clears throat> so first thing, what is a legacy system? Who here works on a legacy system? Don't be shy, put hands up. All right, who here works on a production system? I think there's slightly more hands. If you're Working on a production system, there's a legacy clock running on it. But what I found a really good definition of legacy is denoting or relating to software or hardware that has been superseded but is difficult to replace because of its wide use. All right, if it was easy to replace, we wouldn't be having a talk about it, right? So what's the problem with wide use is that you have a lot of users, you have a user base, and you can't like mess things up. So your degrees of freedom or fault tolerance are tighter when you're on a current uh, legacy or production system. I just shorten it to current production software. All right, if you have, I talk to people, yeah, that's a legacy system. What are you talking about? We only got this in production two years ago. We're still moving users across. It's like, yeah, a legacy clock has started and you can't just go in and make wholesale changes without any worries, right? You have a lot more constraints on what you're doing. So what is a system? Well, I looked this one up, I think it was Wikipedia, and it was kind of confusing. It says it's intercommunicating components that form part of a system, so a system sort of forms a system. I like to simplify that down to a set of intercommunicating components, which may be part of a larger system. And that's sort of a key thing about when you do redesigns or rewrites, you can take a part of a system and redesign it, right? as long as you fulfill the contracts with the rest of the system. And again, this is about the smaller rewrites you do as a team or as a certain person. So full or partial rewrites. Um, this becomes a, a question, right? Should I do a full rewrite? Uh, they're kind of dangerous. We have a sort of large history of having failed redesigns, right? We do a kind of bad job of it. So would a partial rewrite do better? Uh, that's somewhat of a judgment call. What I will say is if you have systemic problems and there's something to do with your whole system that's a problem, you're a candidate for a rewrite. If you have one part of a system that has a problem, then you can just figure on that part, right? And I, I, I classify ports as partial rewrites. So I'm going to port from one database to another. I'm going to port it from, I don't know, one system to another. They're partial rewrites. And the Nice thing about a partial rewrite is you do not have to understand the whole system. You just have to understand that piece that you're right, uh, looking at. Um, anyone here familiar with Amdahl's law? Right, Amdahl, okay, one or two. Right, it says that the uh, performance improvement gained by um, 
getting one part of your system more performant is dependent on how much of the time is spent in there. All right, so if it's all spread through your system, you've probably got a systemic problem, right? And a partial rewrite will not work. So let's go to where um, we've decided we're going to do a full rewrite. And we've decided that there's a systemic problem, so let's look at this. The way, and we, we're looking to start a project. So the way these things, I'm, I'm going to give you kind of a, a timeline or the phases things go through. The first thing you have is you have loft, lofty goals. You're saying, look, whatever's in production is terrible. I can do much better. Um, and I'll give you all kinds of you know, nice slides and probably put a lot of new technologies in it. And because you have lofty goals and you haven't understood the problem, you have a probably very simplified idea of what the problem is. Right? You're going to have these unrealistic deadlines. And you're probably not even going to chart them out. You're just going to say, Something like, I'm going to put a really great system together. Believe me. I'll, you know, I'll take six months, 12 months, whatever. And you do some simple proof of concept programming. You take a small piece of the system and you kind of model it or ape it or you know, do a very rough uh, translation of it. And it looks great. And you show that to you know, your team leads or your managers. And everyone goes, this is great. You know, it's, let's get on the way. And I call this the honeymoon part of the project, right? There's time is not passing. The deliverables look like way over the horizon. You can spend a lot of time talking about it, but probably not doing analysis. You're just talking about what you're going to put into it as opposed to what the problems are in the current system. But then we hit what I'll call the middle part of a project where we have what I call real world trouble. And that comes because you're taking your simple development proof of concept and now you're expanding it to properly model that part of the system. All its arbitrariness, all its confusedness, everything that you, do, you, know, you have to now understand that completely. And you find that it's a lot harder to fit into that nice, clean design that you had because you didn't fully appreciate the problem. And because you didn't understand the problem and you didn't analyze the problem, you will have scope creep. And I think scope creep comes in two kinds. There's an implicit scope creep in that you thought it was going to be a lot easier, and now you're figuring out it's not that easy, which means you have to do more, so your scope is increased. And you might get uh, external or explicit scope creep where someone says to you, like someone higher up in your chain, or says, listen, the users have been begging for this. Could you not just slip that in while you're doing this? And you go, yeah, sure. Why not? All right, it'll make the thing sexier when it comes out. But the problem is that it means your deadlines are probably disappearing over the horizon. And because of that, you miss deadlines. And I hope you have quite a few deadlines through your project, not just one near the end, right? Where everyone gets the big surprise that it didn't work, right? And you're like, now you're in a, the, um, I don't know, it's the pressure, it's the unpleasant part of the development, right? Because now you've missed deadlines, you're under time pressure, you have to get things to work, and you start hacking the design, right? And this haste that you need now is going to introduce tech debt. You're going to say things like, you know, for now, I'm going to do this. I know it's not the correct thing to do. Probably put a comment in the code. This is really not the way it should be done. But you'll do it as an expedience to try and meet the, the deadlines that you've missed. And as all this is going on, People are saying, where are you with this? When are we actually going to deliver this? We missed it the first time. You know, you probably give more optimistic deadlines, but you don't really know where you are in your project. And you'd be surprised. You think, well, of course I know where I am. I mean, you kind of know where you are. You're saying, well, I'm near the end, but you don't know what that means. Right? So you missed the deadlines again. And now, you know, you might have to beg for mercy a bit and say, look, I just need more time or let me cut down functionality. And you may get transferred back up to the start of this line and you start hacking the design again. And you're in that loop for a bit. Right? But at some stage, someone's going to go, is this project a failure? Um, if you have enough functionality, might, they might put that out there, but it may be buggy. And I say loaded with tech debt. And this is kind of a timeline or a kind of phase, the phases I've seen in lots of projects, right? So before I uh, joined Bloomberg, I was a consultant for 21 years. 
I've worked in Ireland, England, and the US, and I've worked in a lot of companies as a consultant. So I've seen a lot of what goes on and what works and what doesn't work. Right? This here, I can tell you, really doesn't work. So let's talk about doing it maybe a different way, where I'm going to take some principles or goals, and I'm going to try and... Um, they're not like a law, but there's things I'm going to try and follow to, to give me a better uh, success, right? So before I even start doing something on a redesign, what do I need? Well, I need some definition of success. I need some way to say I have a successful project, not just like it's going to be way better. Right? That doesn't mean anything, right? So is there a problem that will go away? And that's the best measure of success. There's a problem, there's a throughput problems, there's uh, reliability problems, it's crashing a lot. Stuff that you can say, this will go away when I'm done. It's clear, it's observable, you can show it to anybody. They don't need to be a computer engineer to understand what's going on. Failing that, a backup is some metrics that will be realized. Or you'll say, look, my, I'm doing 100 trades a second in production. My new system will do 500. That'd be great. But these metrics are usually synthetic and they're poorly derived and they're derived by the wrong people. It's not your business telling you be 500. It's you telling them I will have 500. And if you come to the end of your project and you have, I don't know, 250 trades a second, are you a failure? Is it a failed pro project? Hmm, probably not. Right. So that's the first thing you need. The next thing you need is some historical system knowledge. As I think it was a Spanish philosopher, George Santanier said, uh, what does he say? Those who don't study history are bound to repeat it. Right? And I think that's true. So when you have a legacy system, you have to know something about it. And that's, that's so you can disentangle the current system. It's probably grown organically over a large number of years being fixed. Um, this will also give you some context. There's times I've been in a code base and go, this looks absolutely insane. But when I talk to the person who did it, it's like there was a reason, there was a business reason for it, and I have to account for it, right? And it'll also tell you some of the current pain points so you can future-proof your own design. Now, although those who don't study the past are doomed to repeat it, those who are stuck in the past will probably repeat it as well. Right, so that means it's not a great idea to have just the people who were on a system for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years trying to come up with a new design. It's tough, and it's probably something they haven't done too much of. So you need some design architectural experience. Now, what I mean by that is someone who's gone in, done a proven, has a proven track record, has worked in various systems, and is, as Sean Parent would say, seasoned, all right? It should not just be who's available, who's free. I see a lot of projects that are lifted off the ground by just, we don't have anything to do, let's rewrite this. Right? Or we're looking for a rewrite, who will do this? As opposed to here's someone over here who's just about finished or midway through a rewrite. That's someone you should now be seeding this group with so you have some uh, experience of, getting, of, of success and what it takes. The next thing I like to have is what I call a dab of new blood or creativity. That means, you know, someone sort of junior or new, because they have novel perspectives. They usually have a pulse on maybe new technology and stuff like this. So I like to have those in there. I don't like it just to be like a lot of the old guard. And the last thing you need, and it's one as engineers we don't really like to think too much about, is you need the business or the market to buy into what you're doing. Because at, as this project is going on, you have the, um, the, the, the problem of resource starvation. You start as a team to take them off to do something, something else in production. This is a production system with problems after all. People get pulled off, and you can end up with no, no one working on this, right? And that's a failure in and of itself. The only loophole you have around this is if you do this as a one-person side project, which I have done in companies. I've said, you know what, my Friday afternoons, I'm going to do things that I don't want you guys telling me what to do. And I can work on this, and I don't need any market buy-in, right, until the end, unless you have the demos. And if I can prove that I've solved the problem, that usually gives me the green light to start moving it in, right, to the code base. 
So this is what you need before you start. So once you have the ingredients, the next thing you need is requirements. And this is one of the most important parts of the redesign of a system. So analyze how data flows through the current system. Now this is going to be tilted towards transactional processing because that's where I've worked mostly in large transactional systems where I think you can probably you know, adapt it to other areas. But analyzing how data flows through the system, saying that the old system is slow and crap is not an analysis of the old system, right? That's just a comment. You have to gather what I call intelligence about the system, right? Both qualitative and quantitative. What are the peak loads? When do they happen and how does the system react? Where are the pain points for peak loads? What about the latencies? Where's the latencies in the system? Looking at the data will show you this. And, and what I find a lot is the input composition. So if you have various requests or stuff coming into a system, there may be a category of those that are a problem. Right, so you can target where the problems are in your system. Once you do this, you can confirm your intuition or your misconceptions. So you might have had this, an idea of what's wrong with the system, but this will tell you what's actually wrong with the system. And it may confirm or, like I said, uh, say what, what, your, what you thought was the problem is not really the problem. And that stops you trying to solve non-problems in the system, which is another problem we have. You can then apply your own tests or measures of value, especially if you have metrics, where, you're going to, where you are, where you need to get to. And you'll find the throughput pain points. And I think this is always pretty crucial. You know, the first thing I do is I go and I say, how does the data move through the system? A lot of times people go, why do you care about that? Let's look at the code. It's like, no, I need to see how the data moves through the system, and then I'll look at the code. But from this analysis, you should be able to hypothesize outcomes, right? You can then innovate and implement the design based on the real knowledge that you've got from looking at the system. You can do your strategic goals. You can set the management. Here's how it's going to look. But I think this is the most unused and underused design asset, right? Which is basing your design on the data evidence. Not on your misconceptions, not on how do I change my code from, I don't know, 11 to 17, which you know, may do some small changes in your system, but this will let you base it on evidence. All right. Now, the one thing is on a legacy system, lots of times you don't have this data, right? If it's an old system, it's like no one taught in the early days to sort of start you know, mapping or giving instrumentation or having metrics on it. So do we instrument legacy code before we start a redesign? Who thinks we should instrument the old code? All right, I don't know if you're shy or just, you absolutely should instrument the legacy code. I've just spent a whole slide telling you, you need this information or you might, you might get lucky and solve the right problems, but you won't know it till the end. And that's far too late. So you do have to go back and instrument, and you have to allow for that in your timelines. Hey, you know, uh, this is the timelines, but I'm going to need a month maybe to instrument the code and then look at the data. All right. So once we now have some idea what the problems are, we now have to come up with a design. And I sort of say this is design over technology, right? It's uh, we produce the design first, which is how we flow, how we're, gonna, how we're gonna process through the system. And we plug the implementation technologies in afterwards, right? If I need a particular database, I probably don't. Design is usually uh, technology agnostic to a large degree. And based on that, right, we can, like the inclination I think is to believe technology will solve our problems. I mean, who here thinks a really bad design will be okay as long as we put the latest technology on top of it? Because that's the way a lot of projects seem to go. Right, look, I have something new here. Let me see if I can wedge that into the design. You have to do your design first. And then, like I say, the problem is, is if you're 
just using guys that have been on that system a long time, they'll mimic the legacy design with new technologies, which I call a port, which is not a redesign, right? And we've already said that a port probably won't fix the problem if we've looked at it. And just to show you some of the stuff I've seen, like I say, in the last 30 years. So there was this old system architecture. We had the fixed protocol, which is a, an open known protocol for sending financial information around. We would have a pre-process task, which would take that data and put it into our own uh, data container and send it over TCP to an enrichment process. And that would add things in like, um, you know, stuff to do with the security, what its, uh, you know, what its dates are, when you, you pay out on it, uh, what users can make, uh, what users can make changes to it, all this kind of stuff. So it goes to a bunch of places, enriches that trade. And that sent on to core handling and core handling loads the state of that beforehand, applies the state changes and saves it back. So we have persistence. And then that goes on to a bunch of listeners, which will be your program screens that traders look at and say, here's what's happened. The market's moved this way. So this was the old system architecture. And the new system architecture was this, right? I'll show you that again. So the first thing they did is to put new in front of everything, right? But it wasn't actually new. It was just a C++ 11 port of the old process. And they didn't understand most of what was going on inside of it. Um, changing the database gives you a bigger cylinder, all right? I don't know if there's anything more than that. I think most any database would have probably done them. And then, like I say, instead of using uh, TIB, TIBCO, Technicon Information Bus, which I think is in, I don't, haven't seen around any time in the last decade or so, it was using Kafka instead. So this is what I say being trapped in that glass box of, man, the only way to do it is this way that we've always done it. But that's exactly the problem. The way you're doing it is not correct. So like I say, avoid mimicking legacy design with new technology. And usually underlying technology replacement is not the answer, unless you've looked and find a spot, like a hot spot in your code. All right. And using the latest technology is nice. Um, I don't think... Uh, you know, I'm not saying, listen, don't ever touch the new technology, but it goes to the end. Unfortunately, when I see PowerPoint presentations of rewriting some part or a whole legacy system, the buzzwords, the latest stuff that, you know, even business has heard of, and unreal expectations are the norm. And that's what wins the approval to get the project off the ground. But it's usually at the expense of failure. So this is not the way to go. Let me just have a little aside about new technologies because we're always very excited, right? Huh. Something new come out, let me try this. Um, a new version of C++, let me try coroutines. Or, you know, heard about this new thing called, I don't know, Kafka. So new technologies are easy to introduce, right? But they can be held to live with. And again, when you do your small dev development where you've like, I don't know, download it, install it in just your box, right? everything looks swimmingly, right? But what is the maturity of that product? product and is it under, going to undergo seismic shifts in its functionality or its API while you're using it, right? Is the product integrated into your current support system? In other words, will your, will your production support know how to deal with it or will they just say, this is yours, right? Which is what you don't want to be. And the new technologies only advertise problems that don't, or sort of advertise the benefits, not the problems. You'll find the problems as you go to use it. And every technology will have a couple of cons to it that you probably won't hear about till you really start using it. And when I say new technologies, I don't mean they're brand new. I mean they're new to you, or right? new to your group. Right. Who here does Python? Right. Who here knows about the global interpreter lock? Oh, man, you guys are great, because I asked that in interviews, and most people say, I'm a Python expert. I don't know what it is, right? It's global, and it's lock, two things I don't like to see in the same sentence. And it means if you're doing a CPU-bound task, Python is probably not what you want to use, right? Even if you love the idea. All right. So one thing I say is 
do we, we should ask the question, can I use my current technologies to implement my new design? Right? The answer will generally be yes, and then you can pluck maybe one or two pieces of that and use new technologies, hopefully that are already in your company somehow. But if you do pick a new technology to use, remove the old technology. Do not have the two technologies coexisting in your system. Right? And even if you do a refactor, you refactor some piece to use new technology, part of that should be to take the old technology completely out. Right? And that's what makes um, refactors tricky. So the next thing is charting progress. Something else that I think is really straightforward. And I don't know, I hate to use the word common sense because it's not that common, right? But you must stage a project via deliverables. And a deliverable is a measurable, tangible outcome of a project, right? And milestones are checkpoints throughout the life of the project where some notable point has been reached. And then finally, we have tasks, which are small packets of work that achieve the above, right? So even if you misestimate, if you write down all the, right, all the deliverables and milestones that you have, right, and you get the timing wrong, at least you know where you are along the path, right? It's like you go to climb a mountain, right? Distances are closer than they appear, right? That's probably the case when we put, eh, I'm going to, do this, and I'm going to do this, and this, and it's like, man, they were further apart than I thought. Right? But at least if you have those, I don't know, sticks in the sand, you know how far along you are, right? how many of those you've, you've conquered. The tasks give you the resolution. So if my tasks and packets are work, I don't like them to be over two to three days at most. It gives you a resolution down into where you are in your project of two to three days. That's what I'm saying. If you have big, wide milestones with nothing in between, and what happens is you don't find out till really late in the project or until you try and hit that first milestone where you are. The resolution is pretty poor. But tasks need to be realistic and attain attainable. They can't be pie in the sky or just a broad, they have to be specific. And that's somewhat of a judgment call, which you know needs a bit of experience. They have to be observable. And by that I mean when you, you can show anybody this right you can show something you can see it you can see the progress it's not like believe me behind the scenes lots of good stuff is going on but unless you're an engineer i can't really get it across to you so there should be observable either look i can do extra things or look i can run this thing here and when i run it on the old system it takes five minutes and when i run it here it takes 10 seconds right anybody can see what these what these tasks accomplish and you know, you should be charitable. And by that, I mean you need a lot of these sticks in the sand, not just one at the end or one in the middle saying, this is the halfway in the project milestone, and that's the full way, right? It tells you nothing. And when you get to the end, you're likely not going to have a proper system. I liken it to if you go to build a house, right? You have a green field and you say, I want to build a house. And you say to the architect and builders, here's the plan. When will it be ready? I'll be ready in six months. And I go away and I never come back. Six months later, I arrive with a trailer with all my stuff in it. There's probably not going to be a house to move into. Right? You say to them, listen, the first thing I want is the subfloors. Then I want the framing. Then I want it uh, dried in. Then I want to see, I don't know, the, the plumbing and everything. As long as you have all these milestones, you can check, you can see where you are and how far you are behind. Same with programming. And the other thing I want to say is I clash somewhat with the project management crowd or crew. I mean, I like a lot of what I see, but there's lots of stuff I don't. Just, if it becomes a, I don't know, a monkey on my back or red tape, or look, I can show a lot of artifacts here, but I should be focused on the product, right? I like to think of product management. And there's my idea is to get my, my thrust and my attention is getting the product through the phases, not showing nice project management things, right? I mean, I, we do scrums. I'll have scrum boards. I'll have sprints, and you can see what's going on. But it's only as much as it will facilitate me. I'm not looking to say, you know, it's okay if I fail to deliver this as long as I had all the project management in place. 
It's a really bad way to look at it from my point of view. And the last thing I'll say on metrics, or sorry, uh, charting your progress is functionality or code metrics over feelings. And this is not my saying, I heard it somewhere, but I really liked it because I see many times, where, how are you doing on the project? Ah, man, we're doing great. I feel great about it. Right? Feelings don't really get you far, especially if you don't understand the problem and you're not in the right spot. I say functionality, I'll say, well, pull me out, let me see some of the functionality you have. Right, take that functionality, let me see where that is on your chart of uh, deliverables. Right, and then I can feel good about it, but not before that, right? I don't just feel good because someone says, I, I think it's good where we are, because people feel good right up to the end. When they don't deliver, then they feel terrible. All right. So next is the key to moving forward. So, and I have a design, I have my roadmap. It's time to start doing implementing and execution, right? How do I keep moving forward? And I think iteration is the way to go. And as an old manager of mine used to say, quality is the result of consistent incremental improvement. In other words, you always are building the quality in as you move through. You got to realize that iteration will approach perfection if that's where you're trying to get to in a saner manner than trying to spec everything out at the beginning. Be very, uh, look for really far fetched scenarios. What's going to happen when cosmic rays hit my data center and flip a couple of bits? Or, you know, I get a nuclear strike on the data center or something like this, right? These are really far out. Deal with immediate problems. <clears throat> And beware of scope creep, because that is one of the killers, right? Hey, why don't you just pick up this while you're at it? Why don't you move through, and, and I'll show you later where you know, someone tried to make that happen in the case study. <clears throat> but essentially, you want to keep a defined scope and keep it to where you are. If someone has a legitimate reason to break your scope, you have to redo your timelines, right? I don't like to say, I'll just absorb it. I'd rather say that's going to take an extra month. But, you know, if I come in a month early and I am able to uh, absorb it, well, we'll all be happy. But let's be realistic here. <clears throat> and when you have small tasks that overflow the time boundaries, like I say, I like to have tasks that are two to three days in scope. If they start going, I don't know, a week, week and a half, it means you've, now, you've misestimated the problem. This thing means that the requirements were not properly understood, not by the guy probably doing it, but the initial uh, acceptance criteria you wrote. So you have to say, this, stop what you're doing. Let's pull it back. Let's see what the story is behind this, and maybe split it into a bunch of tasks, which can be dependent on each other, or some may go in parallel. But you have to keep the time, you have to keep the time down to like two to three days so you can see progress happening. Now, <clears throat> the real world is messy. And as you remember that thing where you get the real world trouble, you have to really struggle. And sometimes you have to really stack back and think how you can keep to your original design goals while still mirroring reality. Right? So being able to say, look, um, here's some really arbitrary stuff they did. Well, how can I make that part of my design instead of breaking it, right? Or instead of saying, ah, this is going to be one big exception where we take a right turn. No, you should really work to make this fit into your overall design. Lots of times it can be done. And when it can't, which is what I call a terminal mismatch with reality, and there's reality and your design are just not going to make it, then you have to evolve your design. But you should design, not hack. Right, you try and fit it in now to an expanded model, holding to like what's gone on before and being inflexible will just cause you problems. And I was on a, I was on a project where they had this idea of layers of code, my right, code tiers, and you could only ever look down. And they actually had built their own software checkers that if you ever tried to look up, the, you know, the pre-compiling would stop you. And when I showed them that, you absolutely needed to look up in some cases because you have these orders which have suborders and whatever. When you change things at the bottom, the stuff at the top has to change. The first response was, well, how can we hide that? Can we use void pointers? Or can we use erasure or something? 
so that we hide it from the tool. It's like, well, we could do that. And then everybody that joins the project is going to want to know why we're doing something so strange inside the code. And we evolved the code to say, listen, you can look back up. And this was to do with state machines. And when we did that, a lot of the snarls that were in the state machines went away in other parts of the project. So you have to be able to evolve your design. All right. And you must maintain the quality of your code through testing, both unit and system. Now, I think we've come a long way with unit testing. I love it, all right? It's, it's great. However, I have gone to many groups, even recently, and I say, where is your system testing? Uh, don't worry about that. Why? We got really great unit testing. We have unit testing everywhere. And you believe that means you don't need to have a system test, right? Unit testing, by its very definition, tests stuff in isolation. And integration or system testing will test them together, and there will be problems that show up there that will not show up in unit testing. All right? So you need system testing. And that's something I think we're less, I don't know, less well, doing, doing less well at. Now, so I'm starting to do my coding, do my design, I'm taking my design, implementing it. What about delivering product, which I think is crucial, because you've got to deliver for the work to be realized. And that comes to shortening the feedback loops. And seeing as I've said iteration is the key, right, as opposed to getting some very, very specced out thing in the beginning, you, 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 know, you push out the, I'll call it the broad outlines. And then as you're doing it, you iterate through that design and refine it. So given that's a key to the working, to delivering this working system, where are the feedback loops in producing a deliverable? So I have a list of them here. It's a compilation and linking. You write the code like wrong, doesn't compile. So that's one of your feedback loops. Second is you hopefully have unit testing, which says, are you getting the correct results? And you have code reviews, which says, are you getting the correct results in a sane manner? Right? Are you doing it, you know, you're doing it in, in, in a nice way? Then you should have system integration testing, which is hopefully automated right? and not manual. Uh, you then have things like uh, sprint retros. If you do the scrum system with sprints or agile, you have retros. And that's to sort of tighten your overall development process. Right? Not anything to do specifically with your design. You'll have alarms that'll tell you, you know, things are going whack in beta production. QA, some independent cr crowd that tests your code and tells you, hey, I've done something, you know, I never thought to do that. Well, that's why we have independent QA. And then we can have dashboards and metrics, instrumentation on our production, so we can see when things are starting to go awry before the customers tell us. Internal users, early adopters, right? maybe they're just the BAs that are using the code, they're the only ones permission for the code. And at the end, you have actual production usage, which is a poor way of testing your code. All right. So I want to shrink these down to what I think is the main ones for doing a deliverable, and that is unit testing, integration testing, QA, and production. And you see I put rough timelines on this. So to keep your product moving in development, you want the shortest feedback loops. All right. And that's not to say that you catch everything. I don't think there's a problem where or it's a, you know, you can really help to account if you missed a problem in your unit and integration testing, and maybe it was caught in QA. Okay. But that's just that problem should never show again in QA. Right. You should then say, listen, how can I catch that problem on the integration level? Let me update my tests. How can I do it on the unit test level? Because if you skip one of these, so let's say you skip um, integration testing. You say, I've got great unit testing. I don't need it. If your unit testing misses the problem, it's going to migrate up. Or it's going to migrate up to QA, and it has a week. Or in my case, I think it's a two-week turnaround. Right? Or it goes to production, and it doesn't get known. And when it gets known, you're under a lot of pressure. So. You always want to try and shove the detection of problems up this stack to the shortest times. So if you find a problem and it's like in QA and it could be caught at unit testing, put the test in, show the problem, then put the fix in. 
All right. No, how am I doing for time? Not too bad. All right, so building and observability. And this, I think, is something, I don't know, it's relatively new. I'm not saying it's brand new. But that, what I mean, is uh, more like SRE or instrumentation. So you have a live health check of your system as it's running in production. Right, there's the, uh, the, four, the four golden metrics they talk about, latency, throughput, saturation, and errors. All right, you should have some idea of what's going on with your system in at least these, these cases, but usually more. So what we should be alarming on is bad errors, and that's something I think we've done usually pretty well. A bad error is not when you say to a user, hey, uh, error. In other words, you tried to take, I don't know, 100 bucks out of your account, and you only got 50 in it, and someone sends back an error, you don't have that much. That's not an error, that's properly handling Right, the situation. So an hour is if I give him the actual hundred bucks and he doesn't have it, right? So when I don't do the proper operations or the intentions are not met. We also have bad hours like a process is down. So where we have a system, process goes down, we have alarms and that. We're pretty good about this. Or we have something that's just cycling through, trying to connect, trying to connect. Our dependencies are unavailable. So these are ones I think we do pretty well. Ones we don't do pretty well, at least I haven't seen us do pretty well on, is this idea of taking these metrics I was talking about before, and when the crest watermarks, we have essentially alarms go off, right? Our, our, uh, production, um, our production guys get, to get an alarm on it. So if I'm doing something and there's a lot of retries starting to show on the system, like something starting to fail, I should be alarming on it. If the latency for requests going through my system, request response starts climbing, right, above a certain time. But I wouldn't say one request. It's more as the average. Some kind of average is going above, let's say, 50% of what it normally has. Then we should probably be alarming. Something is going to take us out, and we want to take it out first. Maybe a process, an external process has gone rogue or something internal. Or we, far, we start having our process get saturated. CPU goes above 80%. The, uh, the Q size is start increasing, right? It's just going to go to a stage where we're going to sort of like run out of space because we're not keeping up. And again, that's usually either a hugely volatile market, which sometimes happens, or just some system somewhere else is going rogue that feeds into your system. Now, if you're doing a very small rewrite, do you need this kind of thing? Right. And this is something that's come, I don't know how it is, like the few companies I've seen, we now have APIs. There's also open telemetry APIs you can download and use, where you can just put a few lines in your code, and all of a sudden now you can have metrics and dashboards seeing what's the history and how is your system been performing. So it's really easy to do nowadays, but I don't think we do enough of it. I know there's a couple of drives going on in some of the older systems to put this kind of instrumentation in where I am. But is it applicable to smaller rewrites? And I would say, well, I could say yes, right? Be very sort of lofty and say everybody should do this all the time. But is it always practical? And I think if someone has metrics on you, so you're in this bigger system and they have instrumentation on how well you're feeding their system and you're the only supplier, then you probably don't need it. Right? They're going to come to you and say, hey, your system has a process. But remember, if you've gone back and put instrumentation in this to get that data for data analysis, you've probably got this stuff already. All right, let's go to, uh, I think we're getting near to the end of the theoretical part of the talk. So the key to a successful rollout, right? So you bring everything up to this point here, and you don't get this bit done. You failed. Your work has not materialized, right? It's all potentially useful, but until you actually roll it into production, it's only potentially useful. You haven't actually done any real good for the system yet. All right. So when you go to move new users, and most of the systems I've been on have tons and tons, like I say, the uh, definition of legacy, right? It's got a wide user base and it's not easily replaced. It's how do I move users over on my system? 
Is it by new function? Is it by functionality? Not, not even new functionality, certain functionalities of the older system. Otherwise, do it by client. Where I say, you know what, this client, I'm going to move over here. It's usually where people go first. But you have to ask the question, where will the tail be and who is on it? And by the tail, I mean the last users to move over to your system. And most of the places where I've been, because of large, large, like, you know, transactional systems, that tail is going to be years long. No matter what anyone thinks, it's going to be years long. And who will be on that tail? If you do it by client, so you say, listen, let me take the small, low volume, unimportant type client, not really unimportant, right? everyone's important, but not as important as your major clients. If you move them over because they've limited functionality, and remember, you have like an, a, a very explicit scope, so you're not going to catch everything on your first pass through. Right. What are you going to do as far as moving users across? Well, you move, you'll move the small users across, and then you'll keep adding functionality to your system. Maybe five years later, you move one of the big clients over. It's got a very diverse way of, of, of operations and portfolio. So if you're partitioned by function, meaning I'm going to take one class of operation and bring everybody who does that over, usually the simplest operations are the most widespread, and they're easy to do the replacement for. And then you have all kinds of tricky stuff that's, you know, in my case, it'd be like splits and all these exotic securities and stuff that very tough to figure out, but they're a very, very small percentage. But they're done by large clients. So if I have to wait for all that functionality, functionality to get in, they're going to wait a long time. And as one business analyst said to me, no one's celebrating moving an important client to a redesigned system five years after it was first rolled out. It's not a celebration. It's more like a groan of pain. I'm like, ah, we're finally done with this thing. Thank God. So no one's going to be happy about it. And one last tip I will give you. Um, doesn't really fit into this, but sometimes you'll be asked to backport new system benefits because you say, look how I did this. Wow, this is fantastic. Can you not put that in the old system? It's like, no. All right, that's the answer. Uh, because one, you need to give people a reason to move. The other thing is if you think you're just going to take this small block of functionality and weld it onto the old system, which may not have proper testing, very organically grown, you don't understand the part you're going to try and meld into, it's going to take a lot longer, right? So it's got all kinds of reasons not to do it. And you kind of have to hold firm with uh, management or business and say, look, this thing is coming. And when it comes, people will be coming over soon. Your large clients are going to come over. And they're not going to be waiting years for this thing. One last thing uh, before we finish this part of the talk is talking about resources. And again, it's something as individual developers we don't like to think about. It's like, look, you just have to let me at this code and I'm good. But what you will find is when you're on that last part of a project, when you're really hurting, you're falling behind, you're not really sure where you are on the project deadline, right? Management may say, let me add some resources to you to help out. Who thinks that's a good idea? All right, someone waved a hand, All right? What you got to remember is every new developer added to a team initially results in a net, net loss of productivity. You have to bring them up to speed on the code. You have to probably do uh, more helping of them writing their own code, deeper code reviews. Right now, over time, they will become an asset, right? But you're at the end of a project that's struggling. The last thing you need is Something like this that siphons off resources. Now, if you throw half a dozen engineers or a couple of groups at it, which I've been in a system, this happened. I think it was November, and they said, look, we have uh, two or three teams over here. They've wound down that product. We want to bring them over here to help. And we had a deadline for January. And they dropped, I think, about 15 new engineers in. Right, it brought everything to a standstill. I mean, it just seized us up till about March. Right, 
So that is not the way to get faster at the end of the project. Potential ways you can help with that is, you know, if you add developers early in the cycle when you're not under such a time crush, right? Not at the end. Or you add specific training. So you say, I have a small training course. It can be video or whatever. And I, I've done this, and that, that's how we were only held up till March, right? I developed the training course. It's like a 10-hour training course that all programmers have to use because we were using a, um, our own version of Coroutines. The other thing you get, though, the opposite side of that coin is resource starvation, right? In other words, big problem in production, lots of fallout. The solution is for us to start on this thing. You know, four months later, nothing's happened. Or less, people are complaining, but it's a, it's a dull murmur, a dull ache. You can have people taken off, right? And that's usually a problem with your visibility. But if you have observable milestones, you can show how far along you are, and you show that to higher management, right? You don't, need, you don't need to have an engineer down looking at your code. That can help. But it can be tricky. So let's go back to where we have a project start, and maybe we follow this path, right? I'll give you a, a timeline. So in the beginning, what we've done is we've looked at the problem, right? We have defined scope, and we've done that through data analysis. We have looked at how the current system actually reacts and where the problems are. From that, we should be able to get realistic deadlines if you really carve out the proper scope. Leave very little uh, detail sitting around. Now you'll have your data-driven design, okay? It's based, on, it's based on the real world. Because it's based on the real world, your real world adaptation problems should be less. And because you define the scope narrowly, it also should help out here. But you're not immune to it. You still may have to evolve your design. You have to resist scope creep. I'll say that again, you have to resist. Resistance is, resistance is not futile, no matter what the Borg will tell you, right? Resist scope creep, right? Hey, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just do that? And even your own developers will say, you know what? Uh, I'll make something really generic and really extensible. It's like, man, that's gonna be hard to test. And it's much more complicated. Why not make it simple now? And you can, with some, you know, extensibility, left in it, not that it's a complete hardwired option, but let's only solve the problems that we're looking at today, not the ones that are coming along in phase two or phase three. Oh, phase three, this is what we're going to be doing. Coding that up now. Why? We don't even have a deliverable out the door. And this can derail us getting out the door in the first place, which means there won't be a phase three. And we have the milestones targeted. Right, so hopefully we're able to keep to the milestones. And even if we are not able to keep to the milestones, because we've charted out at least what we have to hit, we have a good idea where we are. We're not completely lost. We're like, hey, I'm two thirds of the way along here. I don't think I can get this done in a month. It's gonna be two months. But now you've given them a month's notice. That's a lot better than the day before where you say, huh, by the way, we can't show the client. It's, uh, Right, the earlier to deliver bad news, kind of the less that bad news is, you know, so bad. So we adapt the design as we're going along, keep adapting the design through that iteration, that iterative loop. Are we on track? Well, we should be able, like I say, be able to tell if we're on track because we have a, a roadmap. And then we had a rollout plan, which surprisingly is missing a lot. Right? See people saying, yeah, we're rolling this out. Where's your plan? No, we're just pushing it out, man. It's like, oh, that's nice. Let me know how that goes. So rollout plan, how are you going to stage it? You generally, at least we're out in the systems I've worked in, you can't just say, I don't know, Friday night, throw out all the old code, throw mine in on Saturday, and let it rip on Monday, see how we do. Right. I, don't have that, I, have, I don't have that intolerance for faults, right? In other words, if I did that, I would at the least lose my job, if not be sued and stuff, right? 
So then we ask, how successful was our project? Right? And because we have the unit tests and system tests built in, even when we do adapting design and we find that we have to change something that's really a very fundamental part of the system, you can change it and still have the confidence it works. Right? I was on a, a system where they had that philosophy and uh, the, uh, the unit test executable was bigger than the actual executable that ran in production. Right? I think it was getting up to six gig and we're actually having to figure out ways of splitting the unit test into multiple executables because it was getting so big. But that meant that any time an un, even a very fundamental layer was messed with or replaced, we could see right away if it worked. Right. So uh, again, questions and slide numbers. And this ends the first part of the talk. Right. And um, Here's all the keys that was on the original. So I'm not going to go down through it. It's all the various keys. The only thing I want to bring you uh, attention to is the very bottom, which is a key on intangible, which I haven't mentioned yet. And I'll mention at the end of the real world case study. So has anyone any questions? Yes. So the question is, when I go to roll my stuff into production, it has less functionality. So how do I deal with, uh, I guess, the lack of features that are in there? Well, you see, because I've targeted particular features and my rollout plan or my, my actual redesign overall is to bring certain features over, which I know are very commonly used are the high throughput pieces. And they're usually simple. I just move that part of client's operation over to my new stuff. They still get all the regular functionality from the old system. So it's not a straight swap over. It may be that there's something that will say, let's say, send these type of trades this way and the rest go to the original system. Right? And that's the way of like limiting the scope of what you're doing. And when you limit scope, it's better to deliver something successfully with a small scope then not deliver something with a very wide scope, right? And once you deliver something, it gives everybody the belief. Like the current project I'm on had some real problems and I joined it. And no one, I think, believed it could be done. It's a very, very large system porting it to Unix. And I ported a major part of the functionality to Unix. And it was like business and everyone just said, oh, wow, this can actually be done. And all of a sudden, you know, all my future phase timelines got rearranged because everyone started saying, no, me first, me first, me first, wherever before it was like, yeah, you know, I don't care where you put me in this timeline because I don't believe it'll happen. So once you actually deliver something in production, you have credibility or, uh, I don't know, political capital, whatever you want to call it, they will now give you, um, you have more uh, hand or more, more ways to push your weight around, right, to make other parts of the system maybe start to... Uh, start to melt what you're doing. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, with that historical knowledge, do I recommend uh, not using or, or bringing into my redesign team someone who's been on the system and wrote the original code because they might be uh, emotionally attached to the code or think that, you know, look, we've always done it this way and all this newfangled stuff. Um, you have, to, I think you have to bring someone in. Uh, it's nicer with someone who's flexible and not sort of, completely fossilized out, right? But you do have to do it um, because you do really need that information for the old system. And what I find a lot is even if they're resistant in the beginning, once just to get into the whole thing, look, hey, we have a new system. What do you think of this? And they're part of it. They're invested in it. You generally get them on board. So I think, but I think you do need that, even if it's some pain in the beginning. Anyone else? 
Yes. Yeah, so that's like, uh, so the question is, would we prefer doing a kind of iterative refactoring of the system to move it to the new system? Um, yeah, that is a, a sort of like a sequence of partial rewrites. And again, I would say if you have to do, I don't know, five partial rewrites, that's going to take two years, let's say, of refactoring, you may be better off rewriting the system. Um, but that is, that's not a, bad argument because people have seen how badly we do in rewrites, right? It's like, man, if I do one iteration here, and even if that iteration only gets halfway applied to the system, and then everything else just falls apart, we got something, right? And I think, but I think it's the long way around. It's like, you know, paying for your new system in installments, it's going to be more expensive than if you do it in one shot. And I think if you do it in a structured way and show you can deliver, and that's the problem. People don't believe a lot of time you can deliver. Any other questions? Actually, let me just stop there because I do need to get through the second part. I think I only have a half hour left. So let me talk about the real world because I, I, that's where I live, okay, in the real world. And all of that before you say, oh, yeah, that's great, Pete. Now I'm going to go and hack my design because I can't figure out how you're Lofty ideals can be applied to the real world. So um, this is something from way back. Uh, it is not like, this is not by a time, by the way, this is not my time in Bloomberg talk. Like I've been in doing this like about 30 years. Don't let the handsome young face fool you. Right, I've been doing this a long time. And <clears throat> this is just one I dredge out of my past. And I can dredge lots more. Right, so this thing was called Pilar. Uh, this is what we're going to use for the hit. A case study. The brief history was this was a financial trading system that enriched and processed trades to determine where they could add to settlement. And settlement means where the money changes hands, right? And it's tightly regulated. It was a project re re rewrite initiated when the legacy system, the current system, was taking 30 minutes for trades to process at market close. It's about 4 p.m. in the States. What happens is everybody holds back in their trades so you don't see their position. Oh, four o'clock, they all sort of pop, pop them in, right? So you can't react to it. So because of this problem, multiple tickets were um, issued and they were in the system saying, hey, we have 30 minute waits. This is really bad. And with a ticket, you can't just close it and say, I understand, but you know, I can't help you. You have to say something kind of positive or we're gonna, you know, especially when it's a major client. And this, these systems, or these tickets just said, hey, there's a system in development. And that was there for, a year and a half, a year before I joined. When I came on board, there was no real plan or target date for completion. And they had done a number of ports because they were trapped in that glass box of how the current system worked. And when I asked them, how does the system work? I drew, so I drew the diagram on a, on a whiteboard. First guy come up, tell me how it works. Okay, all right, I got that. Second guy got him up, he looks at it. No, 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 that doesn't work like this. There's another process down here, right? And I was like, oh, okay. And I went through them all until I believed I had the system that they were working on. And it wasn't very different from the current legacy system, right? They had changed some names or whatever. There was no target date. There was no plan. It was just like, we kind of have to get this done. Yeah, and like I say, Bloomberg doesn't like me, implying that this might be going on in their, in their company, right? It's all very... Unicorns and rainbows, where I work. All right, so what, the things I needed, all right, was what was my definition of success? Well, this was great, because my definition of success is that there's 30 minute waits for processing time. There's a trade hits our system at four o'clock, you get back a response saying you're good at 4.30, right? which is horrible. I mean, I don't know how it lasted so long. But, there, but it, it's great. I have a problem that I can say, look, you will be able to look at this and see it's gone away. Uh, my team composition that I had at the time was one longtime legacy maintainer. He was there 10 years plus. He knew all the tricky bits and stuff in the code. I could ask him, why the hell are we doing this? Right. I had one new programmer. He was, uh, I think he, he hadn't even really learned C++ properly. He, he was just doing it for six months. 
And then I had a middling programmer. That, that's not about ability. That just means he's like in the, you know, one to five years or three years. And there was myself who I thought brought some design and architectural experience. So I thought we had a pretty good mix. Mind you, the middling guy got pulled away. I got some resource starvation through the project because I lost a bit of visibility. So analyzing the data flows through the system. Now, um, I was lucky here in that as far as going back and instrumenting the code and seeing what's going through it, there had been a mandate that had gone down a couple of years earlier where we had this, the code that uh, was a big store or something, but you had to send all your data there. So they had done that and never looked at it again, really, right? So we had this data all being held, the flow, the shape of the data coming in and how we're handling it, and no one had looked at it. But what I found is that when I looked at the, the burst that was coming at 4 o'clock, the trades came mainly from two sources. One was direct trades coming from outside companies, direct clients, and the other was an order management system we have in-house, and they were feeding that to us. So we'll go down to settlement. You notice if you add up the numbers, it doesn't come to 100%. That's because there was a third part of the system, which was real premium, and you couldn't actually touch that. But when I looked at the composition of what was coming in, uh, I have to call them A and B to keep, you know, A, B, C to keep anonymity. I found out that the type A was 90%, and type C was 5.25%. So here's a graph of what the data looked like coming in. And to me, there's two big wedges here that I would automatically look to go after, right? Which is the 54% and or the 38%, right? So, but what I said is, you know what? I'm only going after type A trades because that's going to get me 90%. And I think that's good enough for the first, for the first run through. Now, when I looked at the direct trades, because I wasn't looking at the 38% coming from the, again, to limit the scope, I said, I'm only going to look at the stuff direct from clients because they're actually the people complaining, right? So I have 53% and I look and I see the composition of that 53% is 90% of type A, which was a pretty easy trade to work with. It was like, it was a high volume, simple stuff, not hard to code up. And then when I looked at the direct trades, I found that the top user accounted for 78% of those trades. And if I took the top four users, that was 85% of the trades. So looking at this data here, I was able to say, I'm going to go for type A trades, come direct from clients, and I'm really looking to move the top five users over, top four or five users over. That's all I need to do. So this was the legacy system architecture, right? This is kind of sort of similar to what you've seen before. Uh, where stuff comes in, it gets pre-processed. We do enrichment on it, which is just going to a bunch of external services and getting information that's needed. That's pushed through to the core handling, which handles state, transition, and persistence. Then one output goes and gets broadcast to you know, all the financial uh, screens that are on this. And the response goes back to the original request saying whether, how, it, how it did. Right. So in analyzing the data flows, I, again, now looking at the, the metrics that are going, the instrumentation, I found that it lagged in the enrichment phase. And I kind of had suspected that because um, I'd actually gone into the core handling, I think six months before, and straightened out a bunch of problems in there, right? How they interacted with the database and paralleled up some stuff for them. So I was pretty sure core handling wasn't the problem, so it was probably something else further back. Like I say, when I looked at it, I found they lagged in the enrichment phase because there was a bunch of enrichments, permissions, security, uh, external keys. There's a whole bunch of stuff that gets done that was being done serially. And when I mean serial, I don't mean serially portrayed. I mean serially coming into this process, right? It was single threaded. And any hang up in one of these enrichments caused the system to hang. So I, went, I, so I went back and looked and found tickets on the system where it had hung. Right? There was one of the, the enrichers, which was like kind of dodgy, and every so often it hung our whole system up. So that's something I found out just by looking at the data. Uh, looking at the peak time, I noticed that there was throttling going on in that front piece, that pre-process, that there was throttling going on. 
And it was the dumbest kind of throttling I'd ever seen. It was just like, you will only do X trades per second, no matter what. Because that third part of the system, when they first put this in, was getting, was timing out, right? And the other system was funneling trades in. This is a manual screen you put stuff in and it was getting frozen out. So someone had put some throttling in there. I didn't know it was there until I looked at the data. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? How can it be so poor throughput? And I went and looked at the code and I found throttling in there, right? And the other thing is when dupl duplicate trades were coming in. So when someone sends in a trade and it doesn't come back with the response, you keep sending it in thinking, you know, it's like when you mash an elevator button to try and get it to show up. You think you hit it more times. It'll happen faster, right? Now, we would just get rid of the duplicate trades, but they were being gotten rid of at the core processing stage, not at the pre-processing stage. So they went, they bunged up the whole pipeline. At the very end, we said, yeah, it's a duplicate. We don't need to look at it. But as the real world is messy, the last thing that happened was uh, tr there was trades coming in that needed manual intervention. So I looked at these trades over 30 days. The, the last one was for a quarter. This was 30 days of trades. And I found out of the trades coming in, like I said, 2.5% roughly were trades that could be manually, you know, messed with. There's the came in, they were held in the system until someone did something manual with them. Now, the trades were this, uh, the, the part of the system where this manual intervention was a really was another group in a really older part of the system who had no interest in helping me, right? They had their own problems because it was a really old part of the system. So I could not get them to move and I did not have the political capital to make them move, right? But it occurred to me that if you need manual intervention, it's probably a low volume client. And indeed, when I looked, I found that, that none of the top five use these type of trades. So again, I'm clear to take these guys over. So in summary, the simplest trades had the largest volume and the fewest clients. I think I have an efficient win targeted here, right? So what about producing uh, design? So initially, as I showed you, right, the new design was this. You remember the old design, just the distribution part was up there with the core handling. So there was a, a developed new product product in-house where you had a combination database distribution. So you could essentially um, you know, ask for updates, subscribe to updates from this thing. And this is what they had come up with. It doesn't solve any of the problems that they actually had, right? And they ported over stuff. I right? can actually do a redesign. I said, why, why do we have, what is this code doing here? I have no idea. We just brought it over and hacked it till it compiled because this was on C++ 11 at the time, right, which was very new. So looking at the data we had seen and the problems, the real new design we came up with was this, right? If you can see, there's uh, a, the preprocessor up at the top is where the fix came in. And let me see if I can do this. So here is where the data came in. You come down here. And it, went, it fanned out to all of these processes. So all the enrichment happened in parallel, right? And once it got the enrichment, it updated the trade. But what happened is the bare bones skeleton trade came out this way and went straight to the front end. And what that meant, it was very quick. In other words, this had no dependencies on showing up on your screen other than making it through the distribution network. So because of that, it was very quick. We didn't get the button mashing. People were very happy to see this. And then, you know, if you wanted to, uh, so for instance, when permissioning came back and said, here's the permissions on this and updated the trade that went out. Now all the delegates on that trading, in, on that trading desk could manipulate the trade. Okay, when reference data came in, all the data, if you want to look at detail on what was going on with the security, what it was about. But this generally happened so quick, no one would ever see it. But when it did slow down, the trade showed up on the front end and you could see what was missing. So again, the front end received the unenriched trades. It goes straight throughout the distribution. The enrichers are highly specific, so they're able to go in parallel. And if I needed to, I could bring in X permission task. And I was going to bring up multiple tasks. 
I didn't actually have to do it because the things were small and efficient enough they could handle it. But I did show in a proof of concept I could bring up uh, three or four of each. And it would just mean that there would be, if there's a high throughput, there is some contention on the distribution side, but I showed how we could fix that as well. But I didn't need to. That was just the kind of, here's what we can do if we have the trouble. So again, there was a new uh, design. The dependencies were lessened because we'd seen that's where the problem is by looking at the data. We had that fast display of the entered trades, so we didn't have this like keep sending stuff in. It was scalable. I could add a number of these processes if I needed to. But the main thing was the technology really was an afterthought, right? And when I brought that in, I was like, I don't care what the database is. Oh, we have distribution. I just don't have to worry about that. But I, but I really could have used the old technologies. But business was pushing this, and they said, there's no problem incorporating this into my design. But the design tackled real world problems, right? Based on the data analysis, not on imagined problems or just let's start coding and see where we end up. Uh, progress, all right? Putting deliverables, milestones together. I said, okay, the first deliverable or the first milestone is these raw and unenriched trades. So just coming straight in and showing up in the application. Right. And that involved a bunch of deliverables of just replacing those old ported, badly coded ported pieces with brand new code that only dealt with the problem I was trying to correct or fix. Right. And once I had that done, I could show here, come over here and look. Here's the trade being entered. Look at it showing up here. Anyone can see it. I don't have to be a scientist or an engineer. Milestone two was adding all the enrichers. So that was a bunch of deliverables where I'd say, okay, look, we've just added in the reference data enricher. Come here and look. Now you can actually go into the detail of this trade and see all the detail. Or right, look, I've just put the permissioning in. Now, if you look over here, you're a delegate. You can now mess with the trade. So they were easy to show the progress we were making. Now, one thing that I found out, and I, I leave this to here, but I did actually find it out very early in the project when I said, hey, uh, I'm assuming the legacy QA team will be QAing my stuff. And uh, how do, who do I talk to? And it's like, no, 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 no. You have no QA resources. We're very busy. There's no QA resources. And I was like, wow. So I can't do without QA. But what we did plan for is to go to QA find out all the tests they were doing, which was kind of a jumbled uh, list. We sort of took out all the duplicates and we automated the whole thing. So I can run, instead of waiting a week for QA testing, QA testing ran in about five minutes. Right. Which means anytime I put a new release out, it had to pass QA first. I could run QA in dev, I could run it in beta. And even if they would have let me, I could have run it in production. So how did I do that? Well, each test set, because we had the list of test sets, we've implemented it. Look, I can show you now. Here's the test, and we've done it. comes back success. So now we had regular on-demand QA system testing, which really was a godsend. And I'm so happy they didn't give me QA resources, because it really helped out. And milestone four was having the system rolled out and enabled in production. Uh, an accepted rollout plan, right? Actually rolling out the code, had dates on that. And then we have this thing, like I say, where we turn clients on. So it's not that we roll out the code and the old code is not there, both sets of code are right there. And we decide who goes where. All right, back down to the last 10 minutes, I think. All right, so. Um, Moving forwards, adaptive improvements. So we have what I call cutthroat design reviews. Um, and the one thing, the pet peeve I have, if someone rewrites something and you're giving, I don't know if you, you, get, you get the PR, and it's just everything is different. You can't really tell what's going on. So whenever anyone did a redesign or refactor, it was like, I don't want to see the difference from the last code because you're redoing or replacing a major piece of what we've done. We had to re-engineer pieces of as we went along. It's like, look, we're going to have a design review now, not a code review. Come show us what you've done. And usually when we did that, 50% of the code went away. Because people just put extra stuff in there 
that is not needed to be there. And it's like, oh, yeah, but I'm halfway through this. How much time did you get halfway? How much time to go the rest of the way? And how much time for me to absorb that in my system? So we had these what I call cutthroat design reviews. We did build for now with an eye to the future, but not that big an eye. And like I say, we just had this cutthroat provisioning where we didn't look at really whacked out scenarios. We said, here's what I've been seeing in the data. And if it's not in the data, probably something I don't need to worry about. Delivering the product, iteration being the key. Like I say, we had design reviews, but not by, and even code reviews, or not by just one person, because I've noticed what we tend to do is we have our best buddy sitting beside us, and he approves my stuff, and I approve his stuff, and everybody's happy. Well, no, I'm not happy, because it's usually one handshake and the other. So two people had a review, and the design reviews were done, like I say, it was a bigger, if we're refactoring even a piece of our design, the whole group got into it, which wasn't a large group, it was only three or four of us. But one of the key things is we prioritize code reviews over new development work, because we really like writing code, and we don't so much like reviewing other people's code. But again, until you merge your code into the code base, you haven't realized any work. It's just potential work. And you need to start with your fin. I would rather have four things finished than 10 things started and none of them finished. So there was a, an absolute, I, I mean, in the beginning, I had to almost issue an edict against this for this to say, code reviews, you do it. And if it's a re-review, that's even more vital because you probably just have to put a check mark and then we can uh, merge it. So again, how do you get your work to actually materialize? You got to get it through review. Uh, unit tests were a must for code acceptance. Um, if you didn't have a unit test attached to your code update, no one even looked at it. And even though I was running the project, I got it thrown back at me. Hey, I, I missed one test or something. They threw it back at me. I'm not even looking at your test. And then I was leading the project. So to me, that's great because they've got on board with the way it's like the culture has changed. And we had the integration testing that was automated, and that allowed us to spot problems well before even coming out of development, right? We could check the problems, hit, um, they hit beta, they're in there, we have alpha then production, various stages of production. We could run this thing. Observability. Well, it was a long while back, right? We didn't have APIs, and no one was really talking about it back then. So I had basic health checking, which said that, hey, you know, the system's down. But there was no telemetry or watermarking and like, hey, your wait times are starting to climb. You're, you're starting to get saturated around 4 o'clock. And then the, the uh, rollout we did, like I say, we took chunks of some functionality, which we'd highly specified. And we said, that's what we're moving. After we moved the smaller client, one or two of them over, right, because you don't want to move the big guys first. And they were fine. We started moving the big people, you know, the big heavy users over. But after eight months of work, having a successful rollout and having this thing ready to rock, I had no clients because, like I say, there's a switch further up that has to send the stuff to me. And I couldn't convince that team to do the work. Which is a tragedy. I have this, I think this system's ready to go. But the luck would have it. Some people might have said it was bad luck. The wait times are going up to 40 minutes in that eight months. And the largest client, the, the guy who had the 78%, made a direct complaint to senior, I mean, all the way up at the top senior management. And they came down, why are we not do, using this system? And the other group said, oh, no, we'll do it right away. And I think it was like two or three days. They had that stuff ready, and then they rolled that into production. And when that happened, uh, like I say, we had this, you know, it was like fireworks and ribbons and stuff. The wait time had dropped to essentially nothing. It was under a minute. I don't exactly know what it, is, what it was, but the clients were ecstatic. <clears throat> you know, it came down from a high. The client's so happy. We delivered it. And those OMS trades were picked up in the next iteration. Now, it wasn't me that picked them up because I had sort of done the work here and I handed it on to someone else to go find other big problems in, 
in the company. But they were picked up, these were picked up on the next iteration, and that meant that whatever was 90% of the trades are now running for this, right? So it, 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 it really happened. I wasn't just telling them something and it didn't happen. And years later, <clears throat> uh, actually, it's just a couple of months ago, I was talking to the guy who was in charge of that system. He's just moved on, so I can't ask him today. But I'd asked him, does this system need a rewrite now? He said, I don't think so. It's a well-behaved system. doesn't bother me. And we're actually looking to pump more and more stuff through it and sort of start taking the legacy system down on, on a wider range of stuff. Right. But I would have been more happy to say it doesn't need a rewrite if I had metrics that said you're, you know, you're never getting past 40% saturation, your latencies are this low, your throughput is you know, X hundred a second trade, then I could say I'm not close to redlining. So here are the keys. And what was the key intangible I'd left out in the beginning? And that was luck, right? Just lucky the client re-complained and complained bitterly, right, to top management. However, please don't go too far into the luck bucket and try and say, this is how I'm going to deliver on a huge amount of luck. You need to use as little as possible. That's the end of the talk. Uh, I have a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions. <laughs>